from not just my kid, but from the whole group of kids. And I was just like, what is he doing that I'm not doing? And I know other teachers would want to do, but I just want to say two words, Scott, and they're thank you. Because, man, you, whatever it is you're doing out in Forest Saskatchewan, it should be a virus that's spreading across this nation. I'm learning this the hard way, and but also in the good way. Uh, my issue with school is that it is very boring. And it's very boring because in my humble professional opinion, it hasn't changed uh, ever. We love to use buzzwords in education that we're doing things, but you're not actually changing the core. You're changing what people can see. And then when you, if you were to take away the rolly chair versus the stationary chair versus the bouncy chair, well, they're still doing a worksheet or they're still listening to you lecture and, and not doing experiments or whatever the case may be. So my, my huge point of emphasis here about this whole little hour talk I'm gonna do is about the core changes of school that need to happen and give you a little, hey, try this next week and it'll help you, hopefully. Um, when you ask kids, this was a poll done in the States, they gave them a list of words and they said, pick some positive and negative for school. So obviously in gray is our negative words, and that's the percentage of participants that took it. But you're going to see that bored and tired rank the highest. Now, tired is nothing that I can really address. If you choose to play Fortnite till 4 a.m. and come to school at 7 a.m., that's your choice. But school can make you tired by not engaging you. That's one of my qualms. The second one is, well, if you're bored, you're going to misbehave, and you're going to figure out ways in which to entertain yourself. And due to that, you turn it around and boredom comes in over 50% of kids that were polled. And this is interesting because when you look at happy and challenged, they're next, that's good because we want those two things to be in education. But then we feel pressure and we got interested. Then we start going to just kind of some generic ones, confused, encouraged, excited. Then we got like lonely, angry, afraid. Now I don't really know how to fix these ones because that's not my thing. But my big thing is these two at the top, which is bored and tired. And if your kids are bored and tired, you are gonna have a heck of a time running your classroom because if you are bored, you will entertain yourself. Often that involves sneaking technology, arguing with people, poking and bothering people around you and all that kind of stuff. Or it's going to, uh, it's going to involve just doing nothing, right? I'm bored, I don't wanna do anything. So. When you, I love Google image, I always talk about this. When you Google image school or teachers, you get like this kind of nonsense. I have not been in a classroom, K to 12, that looks like this, okay? Well, first of all, most regulations at school say that we can't even give kids anything because <laughs> they'll just make things and things will blow up and burn and there's all these concerns. So like, we often have to just demo everything. We can't actually have them involved. No kid is gonna sit uh, with chemicals in front of them and not touch them. No teacher is going to say use chemicals without safety goggles. No teacher is going to be uh, modeling not wearing the safety goggles actively by putting them on the table. And no kids write handwritten notes anymore. Okay? So this is what education is. <laughs> education is, a, is most of the time uh, a crazy mitigated disaster where we are hoping to keep everyone contained and move them forward as a group. And that's fine because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with very impressionable, hormone filled, finding themselves people who often don't want to be there, who often aren't interested in your topic or subject. So you're fighting an uphill battle right away and that's okay because that's what we signed up for. Kids expect school to be like this cake, but then they get this cake. And the reason is, Kids are primed, I'm going to tell you why I use this cake reference, because it's fun, is for me, school started as a very much a love-hate relationship, okay? 
This is me, because God bless my mom, she scrapbooked my whole life. When I moved from Ontario, she gave me a scrapbook of like my life. And I was like, mom, this is awesome. And then I was like, oh my God, I can use this as like education bait to show kids that I was just like them. This is me waiting for the bus for kindergarten. First day of kindergarten. Apparently I waited there for something like 20 some minutes. I just wouldn't get off this little chair because I was so amped to go to school. And the reason I was so amped to go to school, I go back to this cake picture. And I say, that's what I expected school to be like. I expected school to be engaging and fun and, and everything I saw Sesame Street and Barbie show me learning was all about Barbie, Barney, Barb, <laughs> whoops. So the whole idea behind all of this was that when I looked at it, I expected this engaging, stimulating, incredible experience playing with friends. And you know what? In reality, it was. Because kindergarten gets it. Grade one typically gets it. Most elementary classes get it. To be engaged and connect kids to learning, they need to play. They need to discovery-based learn. They need to get in there and get dirty and play with stuff and talk to people and learn all of those fundamental skills. There is no benefit to removing centers and things like that from kindergarten. Because if you actually take the time to look at this, there are districts in the United States that are putting a push to take all playtime and centers out of kindergarten and replace it with reading, writing, and math. That is, I mean, I have a lot of words for that. Um, but because I'm trying to be semi-professional, I'll just say that's insane. My kid is five in kindergarten right now. She loves everything about school because she's like, Dad, our, our house in the classroom where we play is a McDonald's now. Like we put McDonald's stickers on it and, and I drive the car through the drive through and order my cheeseburger with, with mayonnaise and bacon because I'm a terrible parent. And, and she adds all these things and, and it's so fun. I give her the money and all of that is learning because that's how kids learn. And it is, it is terrifying to me that there are people above me in education, wherever they are in the world, that believe that removing that skill set as young as kindergarten in an in, in effort to improve, quote unquote, their students by giving them more time to read. Well, guess what? When you do silent reading with kids who are five who can't read, they're not silent reading. They need to be in a group of people talking and sharing stories and learning new words and then learning bits and pieces with teachers, not in rows and quiet. And it's terrifying to me. So that's why I love school in the beginning. Then later, and this is what I like again about this scrapbook thing I got, I stopped smiling for school pictures right there, and our last one there, and I stopped in grade six, minus this, which is like an anomaly, I guess. But I, I mean, what am I even wearing? But the idea is that I go from grade five to grade six and I virtually stop smiling in most of my photos because this is where school tends to take this shift of, whoa, slow down on the fun, slow down on all the, the playing and the group work and, and let's get in some rows and some little table groups and let's just be quiet because apparently quiet means you're learning. I don't get that. And, and uh, read this textbook that was written in 1972 because that's really good and uh, fill in these worksheets and I don't, I use worksheets, I'm not bashing worksheets. But if that's all you give, then I'm going to bash worksheets. And the idea is, this is the shift in school that I am talking about. Junior kindergarten, which is in Ontario, I, I don't even think they have that here, but it was awesome. I was like, we, I started school at four. They have like preschool and, and, and things like that. But this was like in a school with a teacher. It was awesome. It was like half days. It was super cool. Madame Saint-Ange was my teacher. I still remember. She was wicked. And it was all play, 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 and then mm, no more. And then this is how kids view school. They view school like this, okay? And like this. The burying of information, too much, too soon, too many projects, too much time, too much emphasis on tests, too much, well, hurry up, curriculum, we gotta move it. Well, you don't know it, doesn't matter, we gotta go. I got a deadline, I got time, we got PATs, blah, blah, blah. And kids are bombarded with this in an insane amount throughout five plus. And that's where, this is where the relationship between kid and school starts to become ugly. So as I went through this, for me, like most kids, is I had to find an outlet to get the stress out, and for me, it was sports. That's me and two of my brothers in high school football. And the reason I use this picture is because, well, first of all, he's a giant and a jail guard now, and it's like this much taller than me. And he is taller, and I am now the shortest. Um, and the whole point about this whole, this whole thing is stress became everything that I didn't want, and the only way to get it out was to use sport. I lived and breathed 
every sport. Every season, I was doing something. And then, of course, I became obsessed with sports. Like most young uh, boys and girls in our kind of age group, they become infatuated with sport, and they had to do it all the time. And then all of a sudden, bang, there goes my ACL. And I'm in grade 12. And this is the interesting part. I, this was my first year, uh, or sorry, my second year ever playing football. We had a high school principal come in, and he's like, I want to change the culture of the school. We've got too much crap going on in here. Football is good. Football will help you. And I was like, okay, that's good for the school. I always wanted to play football. So I graduate. I'm about to graduate, and then in comes the team. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm going to miss this? Are you serious? I'm going to miss football. This is ridiculous. So I graduated, and I did what I called the victory lap. I didn't know what I wanted to do in university. So I went back to high school, and I just took more courses so that I had a broader spectrum for university. And then I got to play football. Well, I ended up getting recruited. The reason I use this photo is because up to that moment, right there, I was going to go to Bishop University in Quebec on a football scholarship to play football. And I was just going to take some baloney course just to play football. Then I blew my ACL the game before the scouts came to sign contracts. Then that's like hilariously ironic of a story, like every movie athlete story. But that's exactly what happened. We played that game. This was before the game. You can tell because I'm still looking not gross and sweaty. And then we play the game, and I'm running, and I try to beat somebody, and I just plant, and out goes my knee. So now, all of a sudden, I say, what in the hell am I supposed to do? Because I have no other trajectory than sport. And that's when this guy comes in, who, ironically enough, grew up with my mom and was my mom's <laughs> friend. His name is Mr. Briscoe. He just retired a few years ago, and I owe pretty much everything I have in education to this guy. This guy tricked me into becoming a teacher. He was our phys ed leader at the school, our what, director or whatever you call him. And he turned around and he was like, okay, hey, I'm kicking you out of all my phys ed classes because I was kind of heavy in phys ed at the time. And, he, and I was like, well, that's a jerk move. Let me be in phys ed. I can like pump up basketballs and stuff. And he's like, no, that's a waste of your time and you're better than that. And I was like, what? That's a weird thing to tell me. And that stuck with me. And he goes, you're, gonna, you're good with computers and stuff. You're going to go with Mr. Turcott and you're going to be a peer tutor in, in computer coding for grade nine. And I was like, I'm going to what? So in I go, and he goes, you're a good leader on sports. You're captain of our teams. People listen to you. You're the student body president. You know how to be a leader in front of people. And I was like, that's subjective. <laughs> but he went around, and he was like, I want you to try this. So I said, OK. So I go, and my whole perspective of education changes when one kid asks me a question. I'm teaching coding. And I'm teaching not fun coding like we have now. Like, JavaScript, super boring, HTML, black screen, white flashy letters, right? Like the most boring thing in the world. And, I'm, and I walk in as an 18-year-old on crutches, and I'm like dragging my zombie leg. And I like plop down poorly on this chair. And I'm like, OK, guys, today we're going to learn how to output text. And I'm like, so what do you want, this, what do you want the, the computer screen to say? And a kid yells out, I want it to say fish. And everyone starts laughing because they're 13, and they think that's the funniest joke you've ever heard. So he yells out fish. And I was like, OK, so you got to go print, line, bracket, call, and blah, blah, blah. Fish. And I'll, fish pops up on the screen. And the, ki the, the kids stop laughing, and they're like, you listen to us. I'm like, what do you mean I listen to you? Like, you wanted it to say fish. There's how you say fish. Boom, fish. And they're like, every time we, uh, we say stuff, they never do it. They do their own stuff. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to become a teacher. Because that's how easy this job is. I just got to do what you want and then bang. Right? So all of a sudden, my whole career shifts in that moment. And I realized, yes, to catch the fish, you must become one with the fish. You must go into their brains and, and trick them like the zombie ants do when they collect stuff in the world of science and take control of them, but they think they're still in charge. So I was like, I'm going to become a teacher. So I did. So uh, long story short, I go through my education, become a teacher, get hired. And then I start, in, I, I start as a kindergarten to grade four. So I was like, what can I do for sport and teaching? Be a phys ed teacher, right? How rocket science is that? So I become a phys ed teacher. But the moment happens where I was a pretty vocal, outspoken person in, in university about things I didn't agree with. And I would get into a lot of debates with my profs about teaching and how it needs to change, going back to this fish thing and, and when you give kids voice and choice and blah, blah, blah. And they turn around and they're like, okay, time to put your money where your mouth is. We just got a call. I haven't even graduated yet. Like, we got a call from a former student who's a teacher in Calgary. As a matter of fact, he's now a principal. And he asked for a phys ed teacher to come change the culture of a school where they don't value phys ed. And we recommended you. And I was like, so wait a second. 
You want me, I'm not even graduated yet, to go to Alberta, never left Ontario, live on my own, teach at a school I've never seen, and hope for the best. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Okay, I'll do it. So I did the, the interview, and I still remember, I was student teaching at the time, sitting, I, I was like, yeah, hey, I gotta go student or host teacher, I gotta do a job interview, this is weird. And I sat, I was in a suit, because I'm stupid and thought they could see me through the phone. And I sat in my car, it was like plus 30 outside, and I had the windows up, because again, I don't know what I'm doing. And I sit and I do this interview over the phone, and I'm just like a blubbering mess of, of like, oh, terrible joke, terrible joke, oh, I'm so really funny, I'm gonna be good at your school, and I'm just struggling. And he goes, okay, we'll give you a call in a week. And I'm like, oh, that's the death note of like, yo, thanks for your time. And he calls me back. So this happened at about two o'clock-ish, give or take. I'm at home with my buddies in our little frat house or whatever you want to call it. Not a, that's frat houses are stupid. I was in a house with friends. And we're sitting there and all of a sudden my phone rings and it's the same Calgary number. And I'm like, oh guys, look, I didn't get the job, ha ha. And they call us like, we'd like to offer you the position, but you have 48 hours to accept it. And I was like, I have a what? So I call my mom, I'm like, mom, your baby boy is leaving and he's going to Calgary. And she's like, you're what? And I'm like, you know that job interview? I'm like, they hired me. But she's like, the interview was today. I'm like, yeah, it was like two hours ago. And I don't know what the heck I did, but they want me to go out there. So I went out there and I had to now either put up or shut up and go. So where I went in Calgary was a charter school for gifted and talented children where the emphasis was never on sport, never on, on physical education. It was on hardcore academic because we had lawyer, astronaut, whatever parents that were all, in order to get where we got, we had to do this and our kid's going to do the damn same thing. And all of a sudden I realized, holy cow, this school is a lot like, this school was amazing, but the culture that parents wanted was like prison. They wanted all this authoritarian, kids don't have choice, hammer them with information, bombard them with facts, fill them up so they can go become a lawyer just like me or a doctor just like me. And I'm like, well, that's not very fair because what if your kid doesn't want to? So I had to go into kindergarten to grade four and I had to convince a bunch of people who didn't care about phys ed. Cause like, I would get notes early in my career of, um, my son is being excused from phys ed because he has a tummy ache. And I'm like, are you sick? And he's like, no. I'm like, ugh, legalities of school. I can't let you participate because your parents said you can't. So I had to change this culture. So I just went in like a nut and I just started yelling and screaming and running games and, and emphasizing play, 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 play. And then to appease these people who thought it wasn't use, useful, I started adding strategy. So I was like, well, how, how, what is the best play to score the basketball nerds? So they went about and they figured this all out. And now, um, which was actually super kind of cool full circle moment, I started the senior boys K-12 school. I started the senior boys basketball program there. And they won their first championship of league play two days ago. Because I still have, I, some of these kids found me on, on, on Facebook and they shared me this video of them uh, running around as the seconds died off and they won the game 52-50. And it was the first time they ever won a championship at the school. And I was just like, I even get chills talking about it because those are the kids I taught 10 years ago that are in high school. And it's those kids. I'm like, oh my God, that's Ian. And that's, that's, that's you know, I'm naming all these kids. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. Right? So... As a teacher, you're gonna face a lot of criticism and backlash, but I'm gonna show you what to do in order to prove to people that what you're doing is valid. And if they don't think it's valid, then I don't care. Because no one knows kids in your classroom better than you. And I don't care what any edu famous Twitter body or government or principal says, nobody knows your class better than you do because you are with them the most. Now, there's a decline in engagement, and I, I referenced this before, that, and I saw this, exactly what I saw. I saw kids in elementary school love school. And then the deeper they got into school, they became super disinterested and disengaged. And even trending that 30% of adults in the workplace actually feel engaged. That's crazy. Imagine going to your job, and I hope this isn't you, going to your job and hating it. Feeling disengaged, like you have no voice, like you have no opinion, like you're just grinding for the paycheck and that's it, and 30 plus years, I'm out. My dad loves his job so much as an electrician that he's retiring April 1st after 39 years as an electrician in a mining company. He's the most senior official in the entire company. And he's a, retiring because my dad's a goof on April 1st, so no one thinks he's actually retiring. They think it's an April Fool's joke, but he's actually retiring. 
And I'm like, I want to be like my dad in that I like my job to the point where I will go past when I need to. I want to enjoy my career. So I, I did a TED talk about this. And my, my question to the audience was, would you invest in school if it was an investable commodity? And most people's answer was no. Or, I mean, you didn't say it. There's a lot of nodding in the audience. But, and I said, it's because when you invest in something, you want it to change and adapt with the time to continue being a better version of itself. So if you buy a computer in 1990 and it's 2019, why are you still using your computer in 1990? That makes no sense. It can't do anything. But that's what education has done for the entire spectrum of its existence. Education at its core hasn't changed at all. Why? Because someone said so. There's a cool website called Education Rickshaw, and I found this, and it's genius. Full credit to whoever runs this. He said, his parents' education in the 1950s, arrows direct the learning. So it was teacher in front, just like this. I don't even like presenting like this, but, I mean, it is what it is. Conveying knowledge on their pupils, and then, in turn, they are supposed to absorb said knowledge and be better. And then he goes, my education in the 1990s was crazy because instead of rows, they're like, guys, brain breaking stuff here. I'm going to put you in groups. But look at the arrows. They don't change. They don't change at all. Because it's just, this is where I get frustrated as a teacher of education. You will find so much stuff that talks about do this, do this, do this. And if you strip that away, you're just taking the icing off the cake. You're not doing anything to connect them any deeper you're just giving them the chair with wheels instead of the flat chair. You're giving them the whiteboard instead of the chalkboard instead of the smart board. You're just giving them a different tool like tech. I, tech drives me crazy in school because people view an ed tech company's push using technology makes your classroom better. Well, no, just giving a kid an iPad and being like, well, I'm a hell of a good teacher does not happen. Well, I'll give them two different math apps. Well, that doesn't help them either. What I'm talking about is a change. So then he says, this has got to change. But I always like to make fun of his pictures. Kids trying to find Wi-Fi. They're texting. This guy's watching YouTube. They can't find the magnifying glass. They're trying to find the cloud. No one knows where it is. This looks suggestive. Uh, that's, he's just got a light bulb, right? And all of this, what he's trying to say, of course, is you know, we can connect. We can discuss better. We're better at exploratory and investigative learning, which is true. And then he goes, look at the difference. There's no arrows from the teacher. They're all, well, let's just be real about this photo too. If I stand back and I say, all right, kids, here's, uh, here's all your stuff. Figure it out. Well, they're going to be watching Ninja play Fortnite. They're going to be texting each other or snapping each other. They're not going to be doing it. So even this to me is unrealistic. Because while these tools are valuable, they're often not implemented correctly in which to engage kids. They're just used as a crutch. And if you use technology as a crutch in your classroom, you're going to have a really rough time. Because when that crutch gets pulled back, kids will just, I can't do this on a computer. You know how hard that is to convince a kid that he, he knows how to write? Or he can circle something, or he can color something, or he can open up a book to find an answer? So I don't like tech-dependent classrooms either. While there's tons of value, what I do in this gamification thing strips tech away and says, you don't need it. You can do this on no budget. I wanted to design a way to help teachers and students be successful with nothing. I didn't want this to be an elitist program of you have to have $10,000 to do this or $5,000 in Chromebooks and tech. I wanted to be like, go in a dumpster and pick that garbage up and wash it and put it in your classroom and it'll work, which I have done. I have pictures on my Instagram feed of when I put two nails through my foot trying to get a piece of wood for my classroom that was perfectly length to fit something I wanted. And the kids were all asking me the next day, like, where did you put the nail in your foot? And I'm like, here. And well, it was, they thought it was funny. So dress in safety gear. <laughs> so this was from the, um, the, the summit that they do, the G20 summit. Um, and this was last year, so in 2018. They said the top three skills for work are going to be complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. And if you think to your classroom, and I'm not knocking you as teachers, I'm saying, does the people who make decisions above our heads allow us to develop classrooms that focus on those three things? And my argument is probably no more than it is yes. Sometimes you have fantastic administrators 
or superintendents or boards that are all about stuff. But sometimes you get very archaic, no, 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 no. We don't do this stuff. This is how school has got to be. It was like this for my grandpa and for me and for my kids and for my grandkids, and it's not going to change. And that's a terrifying message to send to kids, that progress is bad. Okay? So, as I'm saying, the system is not us. The system is the constraints that are put on us in order to do our job best. There's always loopholes. Like, this is my favorite picture of life. Do you see the joke? Just in case you didn't know, that is the President of the United States, left. You can infuse your own personality and your own loopholes to everything if you are clever enough. So here's kind of my five-day challenge that I would encourage you to do starting on Monday. And it's easy, okay? So the first thing I want you to do, if, and by all means, go for it if you want. You might think I'm crazy, but that's fine too. I've been called way worse. Check your ego on Monday. Get some sort of group task that kids can kind of work on independently and sit down with kids one-on-one -on -one and say, why do you dislike school? Why do you dislike my class? Or why, why do you maybe dislike me as a teacher or what I do? Take nothing that they say personally. Because the only way you're going to get them to answer truthfully is if they know you're not going to be like, well, that, that's not what I do, you're wrong. And then, of course, they hear that. Well, why the heck would I tell you the truth? When I did this five years ago in order to develop gamification or take gamification and, and fuse it to education, I didn't come up with it, I want to be clear about that, was I had kids say, well, you talk too much. Surprised, right? We don't do enough hands-on stuff. It's always you. And I was like, that's valid. I've never taught grade eight science. So this is good. This is good information for me. And they went on and on. They're like, well, I don't like school because we can't do this and we can't do that. And I just weeded out some of the, you know, nonsense stuff. Like, I don't care about hats. I would wear my hat. I don't know why schools don't let hats. Whatever. That's my thing. So I, I kind of took those aside and I said, well, just let's focus on like school, on learning, in classrooms. What is it? And I went through on and on, and I took all of their information, and here's what I realized. Number one, students were saying, school is boring, it's repetitive, I don't understand why we need to do this, why we're forced to do this. Do you know what that resonated to me as a teacher? Is it said, just give me a reason to care. That's what they're saying. They're saying, give me a reason to care, because what you're talking about is not important to me. And that's not wrong, because when you were 12, 13, 11, 15, 16, were you thinking about the importance of linear equations and physics and cellular biology or fluid dynamics or where a comma goes, which I still don't know, right? All of those things need to have a purpose for people. And I was like, that's a very powerful message. Thank you, kids. As Brene Brown says, if you want to reinvigorate passion and innovation, you have to humanize work, which is fancy talk for saying you need to give them a reason to understand why they're doing it and why they should care about it. And if they don't, you're going to get subquality or nothing. And that, again, how exhausting is a teacher when you're chasing kids, you're hoping, they finally give it to you and you're like, wow, why did you even give it to me? This is, this is nothing. You didn't try. Second common theme I got was I don't have a choice in anything that I do. Even if I got to go to the bathroom, I have to ask you. So immediately, the next day, I wiped out bathroom. I said, you need to go to the bathroom. You just wave, say, I got to the bathroom, and just go. Because I was the kid who sometimes had their hand up, and they're like, just wait a second. And I'm like, but I'm going to pee my pants. Like, you just got to let me go. Like, why do I have to ask for your permission? At one point, I was 17, 18 years old doing this, and that seems weird to kids, right? There was an amazing, I think it was a TED Talk where that line got famous. You want me to be... It was an 18-year-old girl. I think it was an 18-year-old female uh, student in the States. I think she was giving a TED Talk, if I'm not mistaken. I said that like seven times. And she turned around and she said, you want me to go out and change the world at 18, but at 17 I had to ask you for permission to go to the bathroom. So do we not see why that's a problem? And it was a super well-received message in education. So I immediately was like, all that stuff is gone. That's extraneous. It's nothing. And then I address stuff individually. Hey, kid, you left for the bathroom 45 times. You need to go to a doctor because you're sick. Like, there's n something's wrong with you physically if you need to pee this much. Uh, what they realized is, is through doing this, control leads to compliance. 
as to where autonomy leads to engagement. Now this is Daniel Pink. You may have heard of him. He's got little videos that have gone viral on, on Facebook and Twitter and whatever. And he's an engagement kind of business guy. And he goes around telling people, how do you change education? Or sorry, how do you change business? How do you make people work better, work harder, produce better work, yada, yada, yada. But this is very true. Do I want compliant kids that leave my classroom or do I want kids that challenge me? One of the most influential moments I ever had as a teacher was I screwed up and I said, which of the following objects would float in water when we were talking about density? It was a, it was a test. And I had, uh, what did I have? I had like three clearly, I had wood, a rock, a glass bottle, and then I had like a feather. So clearly the answer was feather, the feather will float. But I didn't realize, I didn't think in thinking, just in visualizing wood would sink, that wood floats. And then a kid immediately put their hand up. They're like, you're wrong. Wood is an answer. I'm like, no, it's not. Wood sinks. And she's like, you want me? Mm, really? <laughs> and she went to the sink and she put water in the sink and she, and she was like, I, I don't have a wood, but, and she started just going crazy about, and I was like, wow, I am sorry. You just did everything I hoped you would as a teach, as a student. You, you challenged me professionally, politely, and you proved me wrong. And then I gave everybody a mark on the test because so many kids had taken wood, which made sense. So do I want compliant thinkers or do I want kids who are going to say that's wrong and you shouldn't do it or that's wrong and I need to tell you why? Because there's nothing wrong with that. That's super fair. That's a very fair statement. Admitting you're wrong as a teacher, as a total side note, is one of the most powerful things kids will see because they expect teachers to be perfect. It's just, I don't know why, but we don't make mistakes and we live at the school and we shower in the change rooms and we have our clothes in the staff room and we don't ever especially if you're in kindergarten right like you see you ever see a kindergarten kid that you taught in public right they just can't fathom my my daughter saw her her kindergarten teacher um where were we i think i was grocery store or whatever and it was just like dad can we get this dad dad mrs watts over there you see mrs watts, mrs. watts over here and so i was like do you want to go say hi to her and she's like and she went over and she like hugged her leg and she was like super pumped and I was like, you're a good teacher if my kid wants to go see you and do that. That is the connection that you hope for. What is actually engaging for people has never been money, according to a ton of research. And what is money in school? Grades. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose give kids or if, you're in a, if you run a business, if you have somehow stumbled into Getka and you don't know why you're here and you are a business owner, <laughs> autonomy, mastery, and purpose are the three things that are proven with hours and hours of research and backed up by proof that are what get people to produce the best quality work. When, they're, when you trust them with autonomy and give them the ability to try and don't nitpick and don't have the proverbial thumb over everybody, what are you doing, why are you doing it, blah, 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 when you give them the ability to try and develop things on their own and then in turn that constant repetition develops mastery and then purpose. Why are you doing this? Why is there a point to this? That Daniel Pink is the guy who did this and he turned around and he said, I can prove it because the highest paying jobs are when you get raises and stuff. Sometimes those jobs go not applied for because they don't fall in these three categories. So employers will stay at lower level, more entry jobs because they feel like they get to do more of this and moving up or getting more pay would take that away. A study backed this up by paying, going to a really, really rough and poor neighborhood in, I don't remember where it was and I won't even lie and try to make it up. It was, it was a poor, really rough area in a high school in the United States and they paid the kids, it was like 20, 40 and $60 depending if they got an A, B or C grade. And they were like, this will motivate kids. Who doesn't want money? And so they started paying kids and then the university researchers come in. Okay, what did you get on your grades? They brought in this like big thing of money. Kids sit down. Okay, here we owe you a hundred bucks for these grades, blah, blah, blah. September, awesome. October, slow down. November, almost kids barely even showed up. That's crazy when you think about it because they're getting paid to do well and that even wasn't motivating enough because these three, these three things weren't met Plus, their home life and personal lives didn't matter if they made this money or not because they needed to just survive in this area that they were. So it's a, it was a really powerful message to show that grades are not the be-all, end-all of your classroom. 
Certain kids, yeah, you, yeah, you got 100, yay, they're going to be super motivated. Other kids are going to be like, I don't care. You know, I would rather do this, that, or, or whatever. The third common theme that I got is why can't I do things the way that I like to do them? This is the autonomy factor. This is the creativity factor, which says, can you just let me be creative? And can you let me use my passions? And I'll surprise you. So one of the things I did with this information was I started creating all of my assessment pieces to be extremely neutral. So that if a kid wanted to do an interpretive dance or make a movie or make a comic book or do a cartoon in order to convey their information in any way, shape or form that they wanted, I let them. And the marking wasn't any different and any crazier because my rubric categories or my marking schemes were open. Is this said project meeting this goal, 4321 or, or whatever the case may be? And by doing that, I started getting in better quality work, more work, and kids who wanted to tell me about it and not just here, take it out, whatever. They wanted to actually discuss this stuff because they're like, do you know why I made this TV show into a cell? Because this guy's just like the nucleus because he's the boss of everybody. And then this guy's like, he's like mitochondria, you know, because he's an energizer and he makes everybody super excited. And kids were this passionate about stuff, which was ridiculous to me. Um, it's one of those things where I just find it's mind blowing that this is stuff that even I had to recognize as a student who went through this exact thing. And then as a teacher, I had to recognize that I wasn't doing this either. Now, this is a very interesting thing because this person is the, I don't even know if it's, it's Minus, Sh I don't know. Like, I probably should have taken better font. Uh, Shakir or Shakif, Shafif, whatever. If you Google it, it'll come up. Um, two years ago at this same G20 summit, she said that my concern with education is that if we train kids on tasks that are automated, that ro uh, she's the director of economics at London something fancy, London fancy. <laughs> And she said, what I'm seeing in education is that we, we're fact, we're memorized, we're know this, know this. Well, she's like, guess what? We can code robots to do that. And that means that if an employer wants to pay you 15 bucks an hour or a robot nothing, they're going to pay a robot. So we have to stop focusing on the fact that repetitive, routine, mundane tasks become principles of education because they will be replaced like that. Then she went on, and it's a cool talk if you find it on YouTube. She went on to talk about how, and I'm going to totally make this up because I can't remember, but it was, it was within 10 to 15 years of, of her when she delivered that talk that over, th it was in the hundreds of millions anyway, of jobs would become ob automated and obsolete globally. That's the current economic projection. Well, imagine taking 300 million, 200 million, 100 million employed people out of the workforce and now saying, what are you going to do? So that's a scary thought. So my goal was revolving around this. We systematically for years tell kids to sit down, follow rules, be quiet, do everything that we say. And then we say, well, why can't you think critically? Why can't you figure this out? Well, because you just spent the last month spoon feeding me everything that I needed. And now I can't struggle. So what am I supposed to do? And the, the really impactful thing about this is that when, when kids are given the opportunity to fail, and we encourage this a lot in school, and I said this in my talk earlier this morning, we don't actually give them the opportunity to fail. We talk about it, we preach it, fail, first attempt at learning, fail, fail forward, fail whatever buzzwords that you use. But then the second a kid struggles, we're like, boom, life raft, I got you. That doesn't help them. It doesn't. Struggle is fine. Kids always say, oh, the struggle is real. I'm like, you're damn right in this classroom it is. The struggle is real. <laughs> And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't come to me first till you have asked other people, opened your book, used your notes, got my material. Because if your first instinct is helplessness, that's not good. That is not good at all. So after you do that Monday talking to the kids, do the same exact thing for yourself. What or why did you dislike school when you were a student? Was it certain classes, certain teaching styles, certain behaviors, certain topics? What is it that made you dislike school? Because I say this openly to my students all the time. I am a teacher for 10 years who doesn't really like school. And what do you think their first reaction is? Why'd you become a teacher? If you hate school, why are you a teacher? And I'm like, so I can be like the worm inside the apple that gets out. From inside, I'm inside, guys. I'm inside making change, right? And they think that's funny, but it's one of those things where if 
when you do on, if you do this, and this doesn't take long, if you do the Monday and look at what kids say, you will be shocked at how much similarity you will find and why you dislike school too. Because it hasn't changed. That's kind of my point. It hasn't changed. So the third thing is you need, it's just going to feel negative. You're going to be like, oof, kids don't like me. I don't like me. I don't like school. Crap, I, this is heavy. And you have to realize something. You need to remind yourself, what do you do well? Because all of you do something in your classroom that is probably awesome. Or multiple things. Techniques, tools, the way you connect with kids, the way you coach, whatever it is. You might do something that's amazing with kids. The question then follows up is, where do I grow? Because there is nothing wrong with identifying. When kids told me I talk too much, I said, holy cow, you're right. Because I started paying attention. How much am I talking? How many times did, did I do this? Okay, what's the answer? Oh, you don't know? Okay, well, I didn't even finish my sentence before I gave them the ability to answer. I was answering it right away. So I had to really check myself and say, okay, what do I do well? I think I'm engaging. I think I'm funny. I think I'm good at middle school humor and blah, blah, blah. But boy, I am not good at giving kids an opinion because I just jump in too fast. You can ask my friends, my wife, my family. I still struggle with jumping in too fast into conversations. Yeah, so did you hear about this? Yeah, I go, yeah, I heard about that too. And I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> right? And I cut off people and I struggle with it. And that's still an area of growth. So now you're going to have a list of why students don't like stuff, what you don't like. But now, what am I good at? And then turn around and remember this sentence. If you remember anything from the convention, remember this. In Brene's Brown book, she's got this researcher named Voltaire, and she says, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You can probably think of a moment in your teaching career where you realized that you stopped doing something because you didn't think it would be good enough, so you never actually finished doing it. I have this awesome idea for this lesson. Okay, good. Oh, but I won't, I won't actually have the, you know, the right colors for that, and you know, I don't think I have enough. You know what? I'll just, I'll just do the stuff I always do. When you let perfect become the enemy of good, creativity and advancement stops because you will expect to unleash something that is perfection, which is unattainable. And that fear of be, trying to do something that you believe is unattainable then comes back to you and then you never advance. Deep. Now, if you go to Tuesday, you go back to your students and you're going to ask them, or Thursday, why well, I say Tuesday, Thursday, you're going to ask them these three questions specifically. If push came to shove, what would the perfect classroom for you look like? Now, of course, you're going to have a couple kids who say ridiculous stuff, like, I wish we your chairs were unicorns and that it rained gumdrops. And, like, you know, weird stuff. You filter all that out and you get to the kids who give you the real message. Second question you ask is, what is one thing schools or this school or me or this classroom does need to do more of? And the resounding message I got from kids five years ago was, you need to shut up and get out of our way because you're doing too much. And I was like, okay, teach less, get paid the same? Yeah, right? So it was one of those things where I was like, I could do that. But you know how hard it was for me to watch kids struggle? And I'm like, don't do that. Oh, just, no, it's seven. Like in my head, I'm losing my mind. But in reality, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to step back and say, they said you don't let us learn because you're too excited and you're, you're in there and you're giving them information and you're not letting us struggle and, and okay. And then, of course, the third question is, you need to feel good about yourself. You have to remember and say, can you just tell me something that you believe I do good as a teacher? You know, whatever that may be. It, I don't care if you think that I'm funny or I'm likable or I, I'm really good at making complex things simple. Whatever. Just tell me what it is I do good. Because this will be, a, this is a long week. When I did this, this is a long week. This is... Monday, oh my god, I'm not good. Tuesday, oh my god, I'm not good. Wednesday, okay, I'm sort of good. Thursday, oh, I am kind of good. It's this roller coaster of emotion you will go on. But the, the biggest trick to doing this, this thing is you have to release your ego. You have to release and say, I'm giving you the full autonomy to say whatever it is you want to me. But then if you turn around and you get mad or offended, the kids will stop and this will die. And you will get no progress from any of the kids. Thursday, again, if you want, you can follow up by asking yourself this question. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail in your classroom? Period. Anything. What is the one thing you would hope to do in your classroom if you knew that failure would never occur? 
And then we go deeper and I say, what's worth doing even if you fail? What's worth attempting in your classroom even if it doesn't work? And those are two questions that got me into this gamification thinking. That said, I think games answer a lot of the questions kids have a problem with. And then I said, you know what? What if it doesn't work if I try it? Well, guess what? I can just go back to doing what I was doing. It's still there. And that was a huge mind shift for me. This is from Renee Brown again. Do students know you are in the arena with them? Do they know that you are not in the stands cheering for them? You are side by side alongside them in the arena, taking the abuse, fighting alongside, defending them, picking them up when they fall. I mentioned this earlier in the previous talk I did. In September, I tell kids, I don't care how many times you fall down, I will pick you up. But I have told kids verbatim, you are getting heavy to pick up because you are not helping me lift you. You are just getting mad and throwing yourself on the ground and expecting me to pick up all the broken pieces all the time. At some point, you have to realize that you're going to get super heavy to pick up. And it's not fair that I devote tons of my time to you every day because you know I will and ignore kids who equally need my help. And the honesty and rawness of sentences like that to kids tells them that you're invested. A story I didn't share and sharing it this time instead of this morning was that the kid I referenced this morning um, came to school one morning and people were like, oh, it's going to be a rough day. His mom ripped into the parking lot, uh, opened the door, and they started yelling. And they, there was not fun to watch. And they're screaming. And then kid slams the door and there's expletives. And mom speeds away and kid throws up his hood and he just storms inside the school. And people were like, oof, it's going to be a rough day. It's going to be a rough day for this guy. And I walked up to him. And I don't know what possessed me to do it. I don't know if it was this. But I walked up to him and I said, listen, man. I said, I saw what happened. I said, it must be rough. So that's got to be tough to fight with your mom. And some of your friends see it. That's got to be tough. I said, don't worry, man, I got you. I said, come over here. You can come late to my class if you need to. If you gotta go take a couple breaths. I said, I don't want you to do anything crazy in class. You know, sometimes you can get angry. I said, it's totally fine. So he said, thanks, he went, he decompressed, he came back in. Next block I had a prep, I ran to a grocery store. And when I ran to the grocery store, I turned around and I sat, and I, I was walking, picking some food stuff up for a science lab. And I found a bag of candy for a dollar and I found a tin of chips for a dollar. And I bought them both. And I, gave, I found the kid in the hallway and I said, here, man, when I'm upset, I like food. And I know you like candy. Who doesn't like candy? And I gave it to him. And that kid's whole demeanor changed for the whole day because he knew that I wasn't there saying, it's okay. I was right there beside him saying, that sucks and I'm with you. And that's a powerful message to send to a kid who, has, who believed at that time that he had little to no competent adults around him. Kid, people, a kid who had been and poo-pooed on in education and, and ran around with a lot of labels that he knew he ran around with. And that kid I saw in high school on Friday, we had a meeting at that high school in our district, and he came running down the hall and he just gave me a little fist bump and he's like, hey Hebert, I missed your class. And he like, I was like, dude, I gotta go, sorry man, I'm late for this meeting. He's like, that's okay, I got it. And he took off, the, he's like, I'm late for class too. He like ran back to his class or whatever it was. But it was that moment to say that I know that stuck with him. And this is a powerful thing to remind kids. There's a difference between being a fan in the stands and being right there with them. So this is a really, I don't even know who Katie Martin is. Somebody just finds stuff on the internet and it's genius. She said, you can't actually mandate learning, but you can create conditions in which learning wants to happen. So that was my goal. My goal was, you know what? You have to be here legally. You have to be here. Your parents have to take you. I get all that. So can I do something in a way that I'm gonna make it so that you're actually not just being forced to be here, but you want to be here. And not only present in the room, but contributing. And I think that, that quote's fantastic. So I took all of this information and I said, okay, the education system to me is an education system in crisis, not because of us, because it is not engaging. You can't fault kids in 2019 who are bombarded with stimulus and notifications and phones and Chromebooks and the internet and say, oh, I wouldn't have done that. You're a liar. Of course you would have. Because that's what every single person is doing. They're bombarded with the phones and the technology and the notifications and the, to be this 
social media person versus who you are in reality to pick on kids that you might not do, to fit in, to do all these things. You can't blame them for being bored when school goes way back to the 1900s and says, be quiet, silence is learning, this textbook from the 80s is full of amazing information, fill out these worksheets and don't talk to each other. And don't look at your phones, put them in your locker, and take off this and blah, blah, blah. All of these things mean nothing to kids. The, there's, no, there's no silver bullet to classroom management. But the closest thing I've ever found is an engaged kid will not misbehave. So if you create an engaging environment where you relax and you let kids be kids, with boundaries, of course, not in too extreme, you will have the engagement switch flip and you will have classroom management issues drop. So, no autonomy, no collaboration, no voice, no risk, no choice, no fun, no creativity. Well, of course, to me, it's gamification. Why? Because games, and I explained this before, gamification is taking design principles of games and plopping them into non-game environments like school. So, games do every one of these things. They give you creativity without constraint. You want to open that chest? I don't care. Open it. Oh, it was a monster. Oh, you're dead. Well, you better restart and not open that chest again. Put this block here, what happens? Oh, it sinks. Put this here, oh, it floats. Oh, if I put these, I can get over the water. It is about creativity. The second thing is it focuses on the user. It knows that video games, games, tabletop games, board games, doesn't matter. You don't have to play them. So it focuses on the user to gain their attention to dedicate time in your busy schedule to play said game. It forces problem solving because games, I know especially prior to the internet, you couldn't look up what to do. You had to figure it out. I still remember playing Zelda on my Nintendo 64 and calling my friend and playing the same level at the same time. And he was telling me what he was doing and then what I was doing and then we knew what to do. He was like, don't go to the room on the right, I died. And I'm like, okay. Don't go to the room on the left, it's terrible. Okay, so we had to go forward. Now I can just Google all that. But the beautiful part is that it forces you to solve problems. There's an emphasis on collaboration. What is the most popular thing about games? Aside from the creative uh, element of like being something that you're not, it's the social aspect. It's being able to play with people. It's having your friends online. Now, I would argue that sometimes those relationships aren't so good and gets pretty viral and or vitriol, I mean, and, and pretty negative. But if you find a good core group, they like to just play with people and be on teams and all that kind of stuff, and collaboration is good, and it pushes decision making. Okay, the, the, that room is going to close forever in 60 seconds. Are you going to go in and grab that stuff or not? Well, you better make a choice. Now you got 55 seconds. Well, now you got 50 seconds, and you can't hesitate. Oh, boy. And it forces you to make decisions. Because how many times do you give... Remember creativity with constraint. If you give kids... To, if do anything, they're not going to do anything, because that's too much. So creativity with constraint is how it works. You say, you can do anything you want, except you have to include Lego blocks. Well, that gives them a base. Okay, so, okay, I'll start with Legos, and then, oh, I'll do this, and then I'll do this. When you say anything, kids are just going to be frozen with choice. And video games say, yeah, you can do anything you want, but you've got to make sure you don't go here or do that. And then it gives you these basic constraints that force you to make decisions that fall within the rules. So my class became known as Sign Tierra, which is a giant medieval theme-based room and game. That was my room last year. I had all kinds of game cards kids that do jobs. This was kids doing an autopsy, looking in medical books that they brought. Um, that's the, the autopsy again. They, I, they were obsessed with Grey's Anatomy and wanting to be doctors, so I built them corpses, and they did an actual autopsy, which was fun. Um, I do choose-your-own-adventure stuff. I do uh, what I call a battle board, which is a giant interactive t custom tabletop game. I try to strip away tech, as I mentioned before, so that you can do this with nothing. You don't have to have a budget to change your classroom at all. Now, here's what I thought, okay? I thought that Ryan Gosling would contact me and I'd be like ultra successful and people would think I'm a genius, but I got exactly the opposite. I got lambasted by people. You're pandering to kids, you're creating snowflakes, the world doesn't work like this, you're an idiot. Uh, all the expletives you can imagine. Because a news reporter saw me present at a conference and said, I want to see what your classroom's like in, in person. She did a story that made the front page of the Edmonton Journal, and then it made Reddit. 
Well, Reddit tore me apart. It was crazy. It was upvoted and I got a ton of positive, but all of a sudden it just started going negative, negative, negative. Then other education outlets started to pick it up. And then when it became an exclusive teacher audience, whew, it got nasty for me. I was called everything you could possibly imagine, but it taught me something because you got to find the good in everything. First thing it taught me is that we fear change and we fear change in education because our change is that, well, look at all the cool stuff we did with education as it is now. And my argument is no, no, no. You look at some of the most successful people in the world and ask them their opinion about school and they are on record. It is documented saying that they hated it. They dropped out early. They did everything they could to get around school because they had ideas that school didn't accept. And then the most inspirational quote you will ever see, don't win over the haters, you are not a jackass whisperer. <laughs> this is Brene Brown, again. Love this quote. Remember I told you moments ago I was getting lambasted? All I did in the first two days when these negative comments came my way was reply to everyone I could find. Which was the most pointless endeavor I've ever gone on. Because if they came forward with a belief that I was a moron, through explaining my program to them, they were not going to think any differently. Then I read this quote, and I said, why am I spending my time on the negative when I should thank the people who think I'm doing a good job? So I went back to the same comment threads, and I just replied to as many as I could, just thank you, copy, paste, thank you, thank you, thank you, appreciate the kind words, thank you. And then the whole thread flipped because I was not spending my time being a scared. No, it's good. It's good. Don't worry. Don't be mean to me. You guys are mean. It was thank you for acknowledging. Thank you for acknowledging. And I do what, what George Kuro says in his book, Innovator's Mindset. I said, let the positive outweigh the negative and it or whatever his quote is. I'm sure it's better than that. But let the, let the positive drown out the negative or something to that effect. So I just started acknowledging. Thank you for taking the time to recognize that you thought it was good. Appreciate it means a lot to me. And then the negative comments started to sink and the, whoa, you replied. Cool. Thanks, man. Started to happen. On my TED talk, there's a kid who said he's, there's a comment on my TED talk that said, he's like, I'm, my mom's a teacher and I think school sucks. And I think every teacher needs to see this. this is a cool talk. And I was like, thanks, man. I appreciate that. And he replied back and said, oh my God, you, re you responded. <laughs> and I was like, I am nothing more than you, dude. I'm just a regular old teacher. So I realized that when you emphasize on the positive and the good, and you just let this stuff sink itself, and when it comes to change, that's what matters. Because we will see this, and we will make this, <laughs> okay? And we will realize that this, to a kid, is just the same as that. And I forgot to do it, but two weeks ago, if you go on my Instagram, you will find it, and it's at Mr. Heber PE. My kids wanted to make a unicorn cake. I am not a baker. So I go buy boxed cake batter and I dye it different colors and I punch the hole in the middle and I fill it with candy. And then I try, I'm like, I could do this. Just go on my Instagram and find the cake. Okay. And when you find it, know that my kids thought that was the best cake that they've ever had in their whole life. And it warmed my heart as a dad to know that they recognized the effort I put into butchering this cake. Okay. But even though it looked horrendous, God awful, they turned around and they said, thanks. This cake's so yummy. This cake's so good. We appreciate that you did that. They didn't say appreciate their five, but they said, you know, that's what they were saying. So recognize that change doesn't have to be what I did or look like I did it, changes whatever you want it to be in your classroom. Because if you teach today as you taught yesterday, you're going to rob students at tomorrow. And just so you know, that was said in 1917. Okay? And my argument is that a quote that's passing its 102nd birthday, that's terrifying that someone identified that 100 years ago, and we have still not changed the core of what school is. Giving a kid at the iPad, using tech, Changing seats does not make your classroom different. Strip it away and challenge yourself to ask your kids, what would make your educational experience better if I was your teacher 
all over again or starting Monday. And those, when kids know that their voice is heard, your classroom will change. And that's 100% my experience. So thank you for coming. To <laughs>